And welcome to the Jamil Rawl Show. And today we're going to be going over Nazi law. And Nazi, uh, the Gestapo, and the Nazi judges were some of the most fascinating aspects of Nazi Germany to me. Uh, I am familiar with the Nuremberg, Nuremberg Codes, and I am familiar with the procedures of, of, of hunting Nazis um, after World War II. And that's a fascinating study that I started taking upon myself to go after many years ago, just out of curiosity. Uh, one of the most interesting things about the Nazi party uh, when it comes to law is it never really mattered if an individual is necessarily guilty of a crime or not guilty of a crime. The Nazi party put on thousands of show trials as demonstrations to the public to manipulate policy, such as the Soviet Union put on thousands of show trials to manipulate policy, stir public opinion, get rid of people or humiliate people that the party had issues with. But as I was studying Nazi law, I found something very fascinating. The welfare that the Nazis had for animals. Uh, Many people who research and study the Holocaust, they're overwhelmed at the brutality that you see happening to infant children, young adults, elderly people. And one of the reasons why experimentation on children was so popular, as well as adults, during the reign of the Nazi party, was because it was illegal to experiment on animals. Experimenting on animals was forbidden. And Going, uh, going to children as test subjects became a favorite. And you had some of the most sadistic uh, doctors who experimented on these children uh, who are famous because of their experimentations, like Dr. Joseph Menkel, who survived the war and lived out the rest of his life in Latin America. Many other doctors who uh, evaded capture, went to Latin America or other places around the world and still continued their experimentations. To Joseph Mengele's end, he experimented on twins in Latin America and continued his experiments. And so this is a very fascinating, and, and to be fair, not everybody who was a member of the Nazi party was involved in that sort of thing, but everybody knew what was going on. Most people didn't. Um, okay, animal welfare in Nazi Germany. There was widespread support for animal welfare in Nazi Germany among the country's leadership. Adolf Hitler and his top officials took a variety of measures to ensure animals were protected. And again, I'm reading this from Wikipedia, animal, it is animal welfare in Nazi Germany on Wikipedia, and I'll leave a link for it. Many Nazi leaders, including Hitler and Hermann Göring, were supporters of animal rights and conservation. Now, Hermann Göring uh, ran the Luftwaffe, which was the Nazi Air Force. Okay, several Nazis were in, environmentalist. And several Nazis were environmentalists, and species protection and animal welfare were significant issues in the Nazi regime. Heimlich Himmler made an effort to ban the hunting of animals. Heimlich Himmler was the guy who was running the, uh, the SS, the, the Holocaust. And again, when it comes to Nazi Germany, you gotta thank all the people who, who, all the architects and engineers who designed those gas chambers and ovens, they all knew what was going on. It wasn't just Heimlich Himmler. It was a great majority of people who planned and engineered and put money into the Holocaust. And in today's world, people forget that. It wasn't Adolf Hitler who was responsible for the Holocaust. It was the, all the masses of people who were ignorant and didn't want to get involved and stop something that was wrong. All right, Goring was a professed animal lover and con conservationist who, on instructions from Hitler, committed Germans who violated Nazi animal welfare laws to concentration camps. You know, and, and Heimlich Himmler's daughter is interesting. Um, Himmler's daughter, uh, she went on to found a group called Silent Help, which actually gave assistance to, to uh, former Nazis who, who might have actually needed the help. You know, former Nazis who couldn't get help anywhere in the world because of their affiliation with Nazi Germany. And so him, Himmler's daughter dedicated her life to helping former Nazis, uh, you know, not just 
evade Nazi hunters, but to, to establish um, some sort of fairness, to, to have somebody who, you know, hey, if we really need money for this, can you help us? You know, I'm down and out, I need a house, I need some money. So Himmler's daughter, when the war was over, uh, Himmler's daughter continued to help. It was very fascinating. Uh, in his private diaries, Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels <clears throat> described Hitler as a vegetarian whose hatred of the Jewish and Christian religions in large part stemmed from the ethical distinction these faiths drew between the value of humans and the value of other animals. Goebbels, Goebbels also mentions that Hitler planned to ban slaughterhouses in the German Reich following the conclusion of World War II. The legacy of Nazi animal welfare laws is controversial. Some critics of animal rights use the historical link with Nazism to condemn the modern animal rights movement by way of fallacious argument of guilt by association. On the other hand, supporters of animal rights often deny the historical link between Nazism and animal welfare. The current animal welfare laws in Germany are diluted versions of the laws introduced by the Nazis. Fascinating. And you can read this article and there's even, going back to the World War II era, um, and I, Hitler is fascinating to me because Hitler, you know, if you look at Hitler, Adolf Hitler realistically, which, who knows who, you know, Hitler, there's a big discussion on who really was Adolf Hitler. I mean, I can take that into another area, but, um, okay, I'm going to say, going back to looking at Adolf Hitler, I look at Adolf Hitler like Adolf Hitler uh, was was a hood who went to the penitentiary. He was an artist growing up. Uh, he wasn't even you know he wasn't even German. He was Austrian, but he was an artist growing up. A lot of people claim he was a child prostitute at one point. But uh, Adolf Hitler, you know, he was a hood. He had street connections. Um, he ended up in the penitentiary. He ended up in prison for nine months, if I recall, and that's where he wrote. And of course, he was a veteran. Of World War One, but he wrote the book in prison called Mein Kampf. So, you know, you're you're talking about an ex-con, and he tried to take over uh, Berlin actually at gunpoint, and there was a, he had a shootout with the cops, and it didn't work out too well, and that's how he got in prison. So, his background is more like a street gangster. A shootout with the cops ended up in prison. Wrote a book, uh, got out. Oh, he started showing up at beer halls. And giving speeches, uh, the people who the, they would go after people and beat them up in beer halls and stuff. So, you know, you're talking about an ex-con who got drunk and beat people up at bars and stuff. And and then, you know, he has the finance. Then Adolf Hitler came into the financial backing uh, of some very wealthy people, and you know, highways started getting fixed, roads started getting fixed, people started being being able to feed their children. They're like, wow, this is wonderful. Coming out of world, coming out of World War One, the the humiliation, the defeat that the German people experienced. Now there's a guy who's feeding people and building roads. We might not really be sure what he's exactly talking about, but he seems to have a handle on this. So we're gonna go with him, you know. And so there's a photograph here, uh, and it says lab animals, lab animals giving the Nazi salute to Hermann Göring. For his order to ban vivisection, vivisection, and vivisection uh, is surgery conducted for experimental purposes on a living organism, typically animals with a central nervous system to view living internal structure. The word is more broadly used as a pejorative to catch up on all experimentation on live animals by organizations opposed. Caricature from Clatter dash, a set a hysterical journal. September thirty three. Goring prohibited vivisection and said that those who still think that they can continue to treat animals as inanimate property would be sent to the concentration camps. So, you know, I mean, you're talking about a group of individuals who got together, started giving. Again, Adam Hiller was an ex-con. Uh, Herman Goring was an ex-con too. They met in prison, right? 
But you're talking about some ex-cons who are giving lectures at beer halls. They get a lot of financial backing. The intellectuals in Germany get behind them. Um, now they have access to the government. And you got to remember, Adolf Hitler was voted into power. Adolf Hitler wasn't a dictator who just took the power. He was voted into power. And to be honest, uh, this is a subject that most Americans are just starting to catch up with. But Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party never would have gotten, gotten that far in German politics had it not been for the Catholic Church. It was Nazi politics. And uh, there's a lot of documentation on that. Um, there's, there was Nazi informants uh, in World War II who told the United States Army, yeah, if it hadn't been for the Catholic Church, we never would have been able to do anything. And so that's now becoming mainstream news at Barnes and Nobles. But uh, Nazi Germany was the first state in the world to place the wolf under protection. Nazi Germany introduced the first legislation for the protection of wolves. And seeing how terrible communism was, how frightening communism was, the Nazis quickly associated communism with 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 uh, the Jewish people and Jewish banking, and so I think that that was a tremendous driving force for the Holocaust, boy. Yeah, that's a tremendous force. I could sit here all day and and, and study the Nazi party. And it's fascinating to study. Most people have an upset most people who study the Nazi party have some sort of obsession with it. And it's kind of childish because a lot of people sit there and say they were horrible people and blah blah blah. But they, if they're such horrible people, why do you sit there all day and read books about it and talk about it? <laughs> you know, it's it, you have to look at it from an intellectual point of view. There's a lot to be learned. And the Nazi Party had plans at one point to move people of Jewish descent to Madagascar, the island in Africa. That was a pl plan they were speaking of. Um, and the funny thing, work makes you free. That's actually a communist slogan that the Nazis adopted. Then, after World War II came to an end, uh, the, the concentration camps um, around Germany and throughout Europe, the ones that weren't destroyed, they were used uh, by the communists. The communists took, took over the concentration camps and used them during the Cold War. So, when people talk about the defeat of the Nazi Party, that didn't that didn't end the kind that didn't you know it might have ended the the Nazis' Holocaust, but it, it created a communist Holocaust because the communists killed probably more people than the Nazis did. The uh, the communists murdered millions and millions of white Ukrainian uh, people. The communists murdered all kinds of people. And they use the same concentration camps the Nazis formerly used. And that is Nazi law on the Jamil Rawlsham.